Recording in progress. All right. So let's see. Oh, I forgot. I'm gonna run this thing out of juice. I ran back to get this. All these electronic requirements. departures in the B school. <laughs> Did you hear me, Brianna? I heard you say my name, but that was another. Oh, I just said I, I was sad to hear of a couple departures in the B school in Arizona. Well, one was never never here, but uh, I guess that was a totally count. It was Okay, maybe you don't know. Never mind. Don't know who that would be. Okay. All right, let's see here. I want to. Chapter 12 today. I'm going to start off on this screen here. I'll screen share going with you guys. Get all this working. started off doing, some of the foundation that we laid with the demand curve. And so even on our little quiz today, we had consumer surplus, right? So um, today what we're going to get into is different ways that companies can maximize profits by doing price discrimination, which in today's world sounds like an awful thing. Oh, discrimination's bad. Turns out discrimination's good real good. Um, it really helps the poor, actually, people who are less fortunate. Um, so in economics class, anyway, price discrimination turns out to be a good thing. And we're going to learn why that, that ends up being uh, kind of a good thing uh, that companies can charge different prices to different people. So price discrimination in general, price discrimination in general, is charging different prices, charging different prices <coughs> to different people, that's the discrimination part, for the same good or service. Charging different prices to different people for the same good or service. Okay, so let's get our juices flowing. Give me some examples. Different prices being charged to different people for the same good or service. Movie theater tickets. Okay, movie theater tickets, good. So what, what, what with your movie theater, give me a little more details on your example. Student prices or senior pricing. Okay, good. Regular adult pricing. Yeah, so you uh, get show your student ID and you get uh, a different price than the non students. So we got students and non students. So there's uh, that's one. Okay, somebody else? Yeah. Maybe you, uh, different department stores depending upon uh, uh, more uh, different department stores depending upon affluent neighborhood would charge more. Uh, clothes to maybe a poorer area? Um, so that one's a little bit, I gotta think about that one actually. I, I think it's no. Um, what I want is uh, people getting charged different prices in that same store, in the affluent area or in the poor area. So one or the other, 
but the location can be a big difference, a distinguishing factor about the good or the service. So that that's a close one. You made me you made me think about that one. Stormy, what did you have? Did you say car insurance. Car insurance. How come? Like depending on what level of driver you are, you get charged. Okay. Um, so car insurance is a little bit of a weird one too. Um, so what's the difference between uh, female drivers of age 16 and male drivers of age 16? More reckless. More reckless. The males tend to be, after data is collected, more reckless and pro higher probability of a wreck. So um, it's not really the same good or service as what that comes down to. So it's insurance, but that the product is defined by the probability of wrecks. So insurance is kind of one of those uh, unique ones that doesn't quite work. Would yeah, it, uh, oh. would the interest rate on a loan count? Interest rate on the loan is kind of similar to insurance actually because oh. um, I, I think there could be examples where people aren't as uh, price sensitive with the interest rate. Maybe they could have negotiated a better rate. Um, but what I don't want to have happen is that one person is more of a riskier person than the other person and therefore their interest rate is different. That would not be price discrimination. But if you got two people that are equally risky and for some reason or another, one's paying a higher rate than the other, then that would be price discrimination, holding risk constant. So that kind of ties into what Stormy said too with insurance, to take two 16-year-old females and charge them different rates for some reason, that's a different ballgame. Then, then we might be into some sort of price discrimination deal. Uh, somehow they're able to get the more affluent family paying more than the, than the poorer family or something. Um, if they're in the same risk category. Jonathan? Uh, airplane, tickets. Le airplane. airplane tickets, good. So we have uh, the same flight, we could be sit paying something different than somebody sitting right next to us or in the window seat behind us. You know, it could be slightly different and the airlines have done some unique things over the last even 10 years with uh, pricing and stuff. So yeah, airline tickets, good. Did I see another hand up? Oh, Jonathan, yeah. Coupons, okay, so couponing is a form of price discrimination um, that we'll get into, and that's indirect price discrimination. So we're gonna talk about two forms tonight uh, that we'll get into later, uh, direct and indirect. But yeah, with a coupon, somebody's effectively paying a lower price than somebody else. Understood? Like Uber and Lyft? Uber and Lyft, um, I don't think so, but what? let me let you explain a little bit more. In order for it to be price discrimination, they'd have to be charging different people different prices for that same trip to the airport. See what I mean? So that, that's how the, that's where this, this gets a little slippery on, on what falls into price discrimination exactly. Uh, let me go to Joe. Uh, would it be like some restaurants? Like what? Give me an example. Um, I don't know. I'll say like both the Wild Wings or something. Okay. Uh, like, they, like they say they do military discounts. They what? They do military discounts. Military discount is price discrimination, yes. So military discount, kind of similar to the student discount, would be an example of price discrimination. So my brother is good about going in and say, hey, you got a military discount every time we go somewhere, right? And he, you know, a lot of places will give a 10% or 5% or whatever. Uh, military discount. He shows his military ID uh, that he keeps with him from years ago, by the way. But uh, and, and he gets his discount. Luke? Early bird special. Early bird special. Um, like the senior discount. Yeah. So that one's a little tough because the then you're into the timing thing. So I want two people going at 4 p.m. to get that same uh, to get a different price. So the good or service is slightly different at 7 p.m. versus 4 p.m. Uh, but that, that one's close. That's kind of a version. There, there, there's a slight version. Let me go to Samir. It was right back there. Yes. OU is a big time price discriminator, right? So uh, different people paying different tuition rates to come here, right? So they're all getting McCullough's lecture, the same good or service when they take Economics 101, um, but they're uh, paying different rates. Jack, uh, do you have one? Like one cake on this Lawn care companies, how so? Just like, uh, they probably you know, charge uh, cheap prices for 
less wealthy. Okay, that's probably true. They probably can go in and offer a little bit higher price than what they would if they're mowing a mansion versus mowing uh, the trailer park or something. Uh, that's possible that they might be able to negotiate that a little bit harder. Okay, one more then. JC. Renting. Renting. Renting an apartment. How so? Well, like I know I rent my apartment cheaper than someone else who makes a little bit of property next to me. Why? Okay, well, that, I want to know what the circumstances of. Well, so the example try. was renting an apartment. Um, if they if they rent an apartment two years ago and they still have the old rate than you did and you just rented or something, that not necessarily price discrimination, but it could be. Or like if you good faith with the landlord, he can give you a credit to keep a deal on that apartment if you want to relocate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could get. Well, that'd be getting subsidized. That would actually be a little different than price discrimination. All right, I said one more with JC, but we'll go to one more in the back. Go ahead. Uh, maybe when they have different prices for females and males, if they want to go to the gym and start a conversation with one Okay, yeah, so there, that's, been, that's been one that's been challenged in the courts, actually, with uh, ladies' free night for cover charge at a bar or something. Um, so, yeah, that's possible. And then they kind of change it. Well, if you look like a woman, then you can get it or whatever. They, they kind of just morph the, <laughs> morph the rules around. So they're not going to have you pull your pants down and, and do a uh, little check or something. So, all right, especially in today's world, right? Uh, all right, so I, I drew the demand curve on here just to remind ourselves that we've got different people out here. Who did I call these people at this end of the spectrum? The high value customers, right? Why do we call them high value? It just means that they're willing to pay a lot for the product, right? And then we've got, as we move down the spectrum here, we have the low value customers because they're, not that they're low value of humanity, but they're just, they're not willing to pay as much for the good. So they, they don't value that product as much as some other people. So we're all different. And we think about the demand curve being High value customers over here, they're ordered from high value to low value. So as you start to drop the price, you're always going to keep your high value customers, right? Because they're getting even more of a deal. The lower you make the price, they're just getting more consumer surplus. So if the price of this product is $10, then we're going to sell 100 units. Well, these high value customers, somebody over here was willing to pay $23. So they have $13 worth of consumer surplus or extra value above the price that they paid. They value the product at $23 and they only had to pay 10. So that was our consumer surplus definition that we'll see come out. And so the idea here with price discrimination is, is there a way that I can start to extract some of the value of the consumers? and um, might allow more people, where the poor thing comes in is that that'll allow me to offer lower prices to other people that don't value it as high, which is usually lower income people. So that's the good part of price discrimination is we're gonna allow the rich people to kind of subsidize the poor people. Now, I'm talking in generalities, but somebody mentioned air, airlines. Uh, that was Jonathan, right? Jonathan, were you the airlines? So, when you first get on a plane, who do you walk by? Stewardess. Stewardess is probably the first person, but who else as you walk down the aisle? First class. first class. So I've heard of an economics professor that would always board a plane and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, to all the first class people as they walked in. Why? Because them paying $700 for their seats allows me to pay $200 or $300 for my seats, right? So. First class can sometimes be three times as expensive as the um, uh, economy or coach. And so when you start to think about it, do they get three times as much frills? What do they get, an extra cocktail, a wider seat, and a fluffier chair? And you start adding on, like how much did the airline actually spend to create that first class experience? They might have spent an extra 50 bucks but they charged an extra 300, right? So they were able to just slightly change the product to people who aren't very price sensitive, the rich, right? They look at that like, oh, $700 first class, I kinda like those cushy seats, right? Uh, they don't, 
it's not a big deal for them to spend 700 versus 300. And so, and so they do. And so the airlines are able to capture some of that value through charging them a higher price for those seats, which allows them to lower what they would have otherwise had to charge had all the pricing been the same. So now if I can charge 15 for the high value customers, that might allow me to charge eight and pick up a few poor people over here. That's the concept of price discrimination, right? So I'm by charging the people that are willing to pay more, I'm actually able to charge less than what I would have had to do otherwise on the, if I had one single price. That's the nature of it. Okay, and then there's one kind of a oddball case here, and that would be uh, kind of a, a theoretical um, possibility, but, and it, it can be in some markets, and that's perfect price discrimination. So imagine that I could charge 23 to this person and then I want to sell another one and I find this person for 22 and I find this person for 21 and da 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 Everybody pays a different price. Um, those sorts of price, or that sort of price discrimination is, is kind of rare. But I think in, when, when I visited India, you start to see that, or maybe some of you have been down to Mexico or other places on the beach. What do you get hit off when you're when you're on the on the beach in Mexico? Who comes around? The vendors, right? We got the Mexican hats, we got cigars, we got whatever. And so, what price do they shoot the American beachgoer? High, right? And then you laugh a little and you chuckle and you say, "Oh no, I could never do a hundred pesos." Uh, how about 20? Oh, he says, oh, come on, no, I can't do 20. And, and so then you go through this process where you're almost culturally used to having a super high price starting place and an American who thinks they're a good negotiator or whatever, and sometimes they come in, oh, I could never do 100, but I can do 80. And they're like, okay, sold, you know, and you left way too much on the table possibly. But that's where you can get into kind of perfect price discrimination. If the other, if the vendor is a really good negotiator, then they might be able to extract from you your maximum willingness to pay, right? They kind of feel things out and eventually get you to pay the price that you're actually willing to pay. Kind of an unusual case, but where prices aren't stated, that's where you can start to get uh, some perfect price discrimination where literally everybody is paying a different price and if, they get, if the person's a good negotiator, maybe they got your max price. Would, it, would an auction be a similar situation? An auction? An auction. Oh, an auction, yes. Uh, auction would be kind of similar. Um, it may not be multiple people thinking yeah. the same thing. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we get into auction situations where we might be able to get up to that highest price willing to pay, the situations where you might not, especially in an auction, is if you have, um, it's, it's, it's a fairly thin market, like there's not a lot of buyers, there's not a lot of sellers, you know what I mean? Um, so that's possible that we, um, the buyers might be in a good position because there's just not a lot of people there. Okay, so any questions or comments so far on kind of teeing up the, the notion of price discrimination? All right, so that's what we're gonna work on today. That's kind of our quick overview. So let's look at Harry Potter. How many Harry Potter fans do we have out there? We got Harry Potter fans, you guys are, especially in your age category, that was probably a good time, so. All right, so Harry Potter, seven million copies. Okay, so you might remember this formula here, so why don't you guys calculate? I'll walk around the room why don't you calculate what this comes up with here for the price? So we've got the cost of $18.99 is your marginal cost. You've got the absolute value of the elasticity equal to 2.18, and then you've got price and price. So solve for price. You guys should be able to solve for the optimal profit maximizing price. I wanna see everybody giving this an attempt. I'll walk around the room. Solve for price. A little L 
algebra to start off today. A little algebra. Shout it out. Thirty-four ninety-nine. Thirty-four ninety-nine. What I heard. Thirty-four ninety-nine. Oh, we got price minus marginal cost over price equals one over the Eli. Oh, I was going to put the numbers in. I guess you guys already have that. Eighteen ninety-nine. Two. Anybody else get $34.99? Do I have a second? $34.97. $34.97. Ooh, could be some rounding there. All right, so P over P equals $1.1899 over P equals 1 over 2.1872. Oh, so then what should we do? Maybe we can do the bring 1 minus 18. Uh, 1 over 2.1872 equals 18.99 over P. That looks like a number over a number. And then we bring P back over here because that's the way my brain works. I don't know how you guys did it. 1 minus 1 over 2.1872. There's my answer. And what does that equal? Survey says, oh, Andres was right, $34.99. Wait a minute, I probably just a rounding thing with that. So, okay. So that would be kind of the marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Um, we solve for $34.99, and that would be the profit maximizing price. So what's kind of weird is that Barnes & Noble, Amazon at the time, anyway, Costco, Walmart, they all priced the book at less than 20. So why do you think they priced the book at 20? when our economic theory tells us you will maximize profits by producing 34, by pricing it at 34.99. What were these big retailers thinking? Big. Go ahead, Noah. No, I think we're having audio problems with, with yours. It might be your connection. I wasn't able to hear you, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. That's, no, this is Caleb. Oh, Noah hi, Caleb, said, yeah. The, Noah said they priced it that way to get more customers in the middle. Okay, why would they get more cut? Why would that be good, though? That Okay, first of all, let me address that a little bit. Um, this thing takes into account the elasticity of demand, right? So that's the whole point of you lower price, you get more customers, but that would not maximize profits, right? You can lower price and lose, make more money keeping the price at 35. So I wanna make that clear, but I think you're onto something there, Caleb. Why did these massive retailers price it at 20? Jonathan. They're selling more than one product. They're selling more than one product, yes. So when we did all the marginal revenue because marginal cost, we're just talking about Farmer Joe selling corn, right? I only sell corn. We weren't bringing this multi-product aspect to it. And of course, most businesses do have a, a few different products. Um, and certainly these guys do. So why were they price, pricing it low? Somebody other than Jonathan. 
What did that do? What did these people do when they came to Amazon or came to Costco or what did they end up doing? Shop for other products. Shop for other products. So they fill up a shopping cart with other products and possibly products that they have higher margins on. And so it's a little bit of a of a bait to get you in. It's not a bait and switch. Bait and switch is where they don't actually have the product or they switch the product or something on you. But it's rather just to get you in the door knowing that if I can get this person to come to my place, they're gonna buy X amount of other goods. We've done research and it shows that the average customer spends $75, right? At uh, whatever place they're at. And so if I get them in the door with Harry Potter, then I'm gonna make money on the other things. So we start to think about things a little bit differently, a little differently with these multi-products. Okay, so that was chapter six, and that was a single product firm with a single price. So it was kind of our first baby step in thinking about pricing. A helpful one, by the way, it's not irrelevant still. So here was the, the details for Amazon. So it's referred to as a loss leader. In other words, we're not really making much money, so, but it's the leading product that gets people in the door. So that's a pretty big number. Amazon estimates 1% of 2.8 million was added from people coming for the Harry Potter book. Okay, so now we're gonna get a little more creative with how we do things. All right, so what about substitutes? Suppose a bar purchases a nearby rival bar. So you got two bars selling beer and liquor and wine or whatever. Would you change the price of drinks and food at each store? So now you have two, you bought the other one. What would you do? the price of one to drive them to go to the other okay good you might yeah you might want to drive them from one we're going to talk about that so um raise the price of one to drive traffic to the other could you raise price of both yes yeah yeah you could raise price of both right so so that's the idea when we have um less substitutes that makes the demand curve flatter or steeper when we have less substitutes flatter or steeper steeper right so more inelastic there's less choices or whatever they're going to choose they're going to end up uh, at one of your stores so we don't want to compete with ourselves um, sometimes we call that cannibalization we're cannibalizing our one product because why would i do that i'm just stealing from myself so you don't want to cannibalize your own product um, and that's uh, something that uh, businesses with uh, multiple products or even single prices have to uh, single products have to be uh, careful about cannibalizing their own good and, and that's kind of when, when I say the single product it means um, if I drop my price to sell more people uh, I'm going to lose uh, I'm gonna gain some people but maybe not enough right and so I'm kind of defeating the purpose which gets back to uh, elasticities all right so demand for a bundle of substitutes is less elastic. Raise the product, push people to more price sensitive or higher margins, kind of what Jeremiah was getting at. So another strategy is to differentiate. So this last thing here on uh, add a bunch of beers at one and maybe a wider range at another. So we try to change the product a little bit because then we're picking up different preferences, right? So we're no longer competing with ourselves. So now I'm not having to try to make myself better than the other thing. We're just kind of recognizing that some people like uh, that style of place and maybe it's the decor and other things and other people like um, or the blue collar dive bar. 
All right, so what if they're complements? So suppose the bar purchases a parking lot. So with complements, what happens if I raise the price of parking and parking and my bar business go together? If I raise the price of parking, what happens to bar business? It goes down, it, goes, it gets more expensive, right? The package of driving to the bar, getting drunk, driving drunk home, that whole package gets a little more expensive when we have the parking lot. No, we're not doing that, of course. We have a, Designated driver, somebody mentioned Uber, Andres, that was you. Uh, Uber we got now, so we don't have to take that risk. So, uh, but that's the concept. So we, can we nudge people uh, into one product or the other? And now we can start thinking about our margins. So I got this little note here because I was confused when I first started teaching this. I'm like, gosh, that doesn't seem right. The book said to lower the price of both, um, but I thought you could decrease um, the price of the lower margin good, right? So we use these two goods together. So I decrease the price of the lower margin good, and that's going to push people into uh, utilizing the whole package more, but you'll sell more of the the one you make more money on. Well, the book said lower both. So I emailed the author of the book, Luke Fro, and asked him, and he said, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> that, they, that they messed up. I don't even know, I, I can't remember, I haven't looked at later versions of the book if they changed that, but uh, he agreed with me. He said, oh, I didn't write this section of the book, my co-author did, so. <laughs> so that was kind of my funny thing with that. But any questions on that? So now we're thinking a little differently. If I've got markup in one that's higher than the other, maybe I can start to push people. Okay, so what about cruise ships, hotels, stadiums, commercial parking lots? What's the difference between those and beer and popcorn? What's the difference? Somebody who hasn't talked yet. Yeah? There's a limit to what? A, li a limited number, yeah. There's a capacity constraint, right? So. Um, cruise ship only has so many beds, hotels, stadiums, capacity. All of these things have a capacity constraint. So we kind of have a two-step process that we go through um, when we look at things like this with capacity constraints. The first step is kind of the long run. How big of a cruise ship do I make? How many seats does the stadium hold? Should it be an 80,000 seat stadium or should it be a 64,000 seat stadium? Which direction, we got a lot of uh, student athletes in here right now, what direction have stadiums gone in the last 20, 30 years? Smaller or bigger? Smaller, yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, back in my day, when I was your guys' age, um, it was more of the bigger's better, 80,000 seats, right? And, and 100,000 even in some. And so what they found over time was that empty stadiums aren't very fun. And so it was better to keep the stadium a little smaller, keep the high value customers, what's happened to ticket prices? Crazy high, right? So I heard, um, what did I, what was the crazy seats? Oh, that was for a concert. Oh, for Bruce Springsteen. Uh, that some of the tickets were $4,000 for like the front two rows to Bruce Springsteen. I think it was Bruce Springsteen, I heard on the, on the news. And, uh, you know, Dana, it was on Dana and Parks, a local radio show, and, and uh, Dana's like, that's like Super Bowl pricing. Well, not really. Super Bowl pricing now is like $20,000, right? So they, they bring the Super Bowl to these 64,000 seat uh, places, and those are astronomical too. All right, so that's what we want to think about is that problem on pricing. And so this two-step process is figuring out how big the stadium should be in the design, prop, in the design area, and then finally, what should it be priced at when we open? So what are the issues that come up with this cost of the building and capacities being a fixed cost or sunk cost versus when we open? What are you imagining 
once we start to do a, a hotel or a stadium, what's the ratio of variable cost to fixed cost? And I'm not asking for an actual number, but which one's bigger? Fixed cost, right? There's lots of fixed costs because the stadium was $5 billion. And now what does it cost to put on an event? Well, I gotta hire some people to come sell food and tickets and whatever. But relative to the overall cost, it's all fixed cost, right? So a very small variable cost and very high fixed cost. So this first step's important. I'm thinking about what's my capacity gonna be because the whole thing's going to change dramatically once you open up. Once you open up, the pricing uh, idea is going to change um, because of your low variable cost. So once you open, now you've got things pretty cheap. So you can um, have some flexibility and you know how many seats you have, right? You know the amount you want to sell. If you want to pack the stadium and it's 64,000, now we can start to play around with the elasticities. What's the right price? When I built the project, I thought we'd get 64,000, but um, attendance has been around 40,000. How do I get 24,000 more people there? Lower the price, price discrimination, differential seating, you know, whatever. So we start looking at all of that to get up the attendance to the games. Um, one of the things I saw the Royals doing, I had a, a friend of mine uh, bought a, uh, I guess it was the, a monthly pass. Is anybody familiar with Royals, uh, Kansas City Royals uh, tickets? So he bought a pass for the month of July, I guess it was, that he can go to any of the games for free. Um, I think he still maybe had to pay for parking, but I'm not even sure if he had to do that. It was 30 bucks. 30 bucks to go, and does that sound like a deal? You can go to all of the games in July. It was like a free July pass for 30 bucks. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I might, I told him, I said, I might use this one in class. So why were the Royals able to do that for 30 bucks? When I'm thinking Royals, I'm thinking John Sherman, one of our big donors, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, but one of our big donors to OU is one of the owners of the Kansas City Royals, John Sherman. Luke? It's hot as hell outside. It's hot as hell, okay. Well, what is that? I don't know if that helps. What do you mean? that? Uh... No one's going to want to sit outside. The okay, no one, you're saying to get more people there, no one's going to want to sit outside, okay? What else? More hot dogs, right? So we're gonna make the money on the vending stuff. And so they know that that experience is, hey, I can get people excited about coming to every Royals game for this free pass for 30 bucks. I'm like, 30 bucks? I might as well get the, the month of July. And if I go to one game, I've got my money back, right? Or that, that type of mentality. But of course, we all know when we go there and the popcorn and the nachos and the, the beer. and the beer on a hot day, right? The beer sales are through the roof and you're paying $15 for a beer. So they're going to make money on those high margin products, the complementary products that are at the stadium, where that glass of beer will cost them two bucks and they're selling it for 15, right? So they're making buco dollars off the beer. The ticket was gonna stay empty anyway. The stadium's gonna stay empty. Who cares what, this, what, this, what the seating is in the stadium? Get the people here to buy the beer and the popcorn and the hot dog, right? So that's, that's uh, thinking about the problem a little bit differently when, when we have these capacity constraints and we've got extra seats. Um, I kind of said the same thing about Ottawa University. When I started here, we had 550 student population. I'm like, we've got excess capacity, you know? Who cares what the discount rate is? We can give a scholarship and get somebody here and then they're paying room and board and other things, right? Now, as we start to get to capacity, which I'd say with our campus being at 850 students, yeah, we're getting there. You start to feel a little elbows once we get up to this level and up to 900. You get to a point where, oh, we need to add on another building. Now, should we build another building? Well, that's all of a sudden a different decision, right? Now, now we're getting into if it's donor funded and other things, you know, those are all considerations. But we better think that we're going to stay at 850 and not drop down to 550 and have even extra capacity after that. So. 
Um, I talked to the vice president at the time and, and uh, Chancellor Eichner, um, tried to give them a little um, talk on price discrimination and like getting butts in seats and who cares if we give them a, a little bit higher uh, athletic scholarship, um, as long as we can get them, get them here and get them in and give them a quality product. What's that? And the meal plan, yeah, exactly, that type of stuff, yeah, so room and board and whatever. Okay, so let's see how you guys are doing here. So suppose we've got a new hotel and we've estimated the elasticity at 1.66, which gives us 300 rooms. So the annualized long run marginal cost of the building, that's everything, cleaning, heating, blah, 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 is $400 per day. Pre-build expected marginal revenue and marginal cost. So we've built our Excel spreadsheet, right? We've like done the numbers, like, oh, we have a 300 room hotel, let's assume a 20% vacancy, and they run the whole spreadsheet, and they decided to go with the 300 room hotel based on that data. Now, in the short run, when we're ignoring those fixed costs, it's only $40 per day, right? So again, we have high fixed costs, uh, low variable costs. So, another one for you to put to pencil here. If demand was overestimated, what should the rooms be priced at if the actual occupancy is 250? So we open the hotel, we price it at 400, because that's what was gonna maximize profits, but we're only having 250 rooms. So go ahead and do a little math again, a little math problem. This is our elasticity formula, which I think we started off with at the top. Percentage change in price, Solve for that percentage change of price and apply it. First one with an answer, shout it out. You got 11%, JC? Yeah. Negative 11%. So negative 11%. Oh, negative. we got to watch that, yes, that sign. We got a negative, okay, because we can slip that negative back here to here at 1.66. Right. So around 11% drop. Is everybody getting kind of how to tackle that problem at least? I just want you to kind of look and kind of force your brain to say, I can do this algebra. This isn't too bad, right? We got. Percentage change in quantity, we want 300, we have 250, 300 minus 250 is 50, divided by the average of the two would be 275. And I think you're, uh, with the average, you, you got 11? Did you do that? Yeah, right here. Oh, decreased price, I'm sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking about the quantity. So bring price down to about 356 a night. So again, we can kind of use this to say, what is going to maximize profits now? I screwed up in the past. I can't rebuild my rooms to reduce it to 250. I'm screwed. How do I maximize profits now? Well, this is how you do it. We want to get that hotel uh, filled and 356 is going to fill it. And so that would be a profitable thing to do. Okay, questions or comments on that one? All right. So, we get into a little behavioral economics with pricing decisions. So back in 2008, some airlines began charging for snacks when they used to get their uh, snacks for free. 
And of course we have airlines now that do this all the time. But how do you think that made people feel when they boarded that plane the first time and instead of them coming around and dishing out free snacks, they said, would you like a snack, sir? That'll be $2. How do you think people felt? Not so good, upset. right? Yeah, a little upset, right? And so um, here's what we've learned in behavioral economics is that you feel losses harder than you feel gains. So in other words, if instead the status quo was that you never got anything free on an airplane and you get on the airplane and they start passing around free peanuts and they're like, here you go, sir. And you're like, oh, that's nice. You know, how would you value that peanut? You're like, oh, that's a nice little add on. It's about time they gave me something for this $350 ticket, right? Nice that you could give me a, a dollar bag of peanuts or something. And so you don't feel the gain as much as you feel the loss. So if the status quo is that you always got the free things and then we take away the peanuts, the rational economist calculation would say you would value them the same. The value of the peanuts is a dollar or two dollars or how, whatever, your, whatever your valuation of the peanuts. It wouldn't matter if you're getting the peanuts or getting having the peanuts taken away. It would be the same, but that's not what we find with pricing, that people feel these losses more than they feel the gains. So to combat that, um, economists and psychologists, I guess, have kind of worked together in how you frame the question. How do you frame the question of, oh, we're able to give you this, you're gaining something instead of losing something? So how you frame something might be uh, important. Um, how they frame the question of, would you like to give your uh, organs away uh, if you get into an accident? So there was an interesting uh, study done in Austria and Germany. And so one box said when you were filling out your driver's license, you had to check the box, uh, yes, I would like to be an organ donor. And then in Austria, it was, you had to check the box, no, I would not like to be an organ donor. And so again, economic theory would predict it's just being worded differently, but it went from 20% of people being organ donors to 90%. So instead of opting into something or opting out, depending on how you frame it, uh, can make a big difference in organ donations. You're dead anyway, give your organs away, who cares, right? But maybe people don't. But if you feel real strongly about it, then you would check that box. But a lot of people are just too lazy. Oh, that's kind of hard to check the box. Like there's a cost involved with checking the box. And so um, the, uh, Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics a few years back, uh, found this with investing. So if a lot of companies have changed their uh, wording around, would you like to do the retirement plan? Check this box if yes. Well, now it says check this box if you don't want to um, participate in the retirement plan. And by making that subtle change, you get a lot more people contributing to a retirement plan, just by the way it's framed, by the way the wording is. And so these biases have been kind of a relatively new area in economics over the last uh, 30, 30 years or so, 30, 40 years. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so fairness. When a big natural disaster hits, could Home Depot double the price of lumber? Could they? Would they still sell lumber? Would it be a profitable thing to do? It might be profitable in the short run, right? Uh, but the news headlines and everything else might cause some long run problems. So that's been what people have learned on uh, addressing natural disasters. Now, it's not always a good thing, by the way. So having prices be higher, uh, you'll see we, there's lots of short videos and people have done, uh, economists have done some research on this that we would have addressed the natural disaster a lot better had we allowed there to be quote unquote price gouging if prices would have been allowed to go up higher. Why? Because some people are just getting stuff just in case, right? We all ran to, uh, when COVID hit, right, with the toilet paper shortage, we all like, oh, I gotta have toilet paper, and so we all run and grab toilet paper. Whereas if prices would have went up for toilet paper, we're like, I don't need toilet paper that bad, right? 
but Walmart and those places have found that they can't do it. So sometimes they would go to rationing, limit one per customer, right? We saw that during COVID, um, that they might try to ration it out. And then you also have secondary markets that evolve. So if you were able to buy cheap toilet paper at Walmart, then you could go resell it on eBay for a triple or put it on Facebook Marketplace. And so people turned into a little business uh, making proposition because, oh, there's a toilet paper shortage, um, but I've got some available. You know, they ran to, they were the first ones to Walmart when it opened and, and bought, cleaned out the shelves. So not having prices adjust can cause some uh, pinches even in the face of some of these natural disasters. All right, questions or comments there? So I was just mentioning kind of scalping prices or secondary markets with the toilet paper. Um, there's been situations of uh, artists who have gotten busted doing this. So the artist doesn't want to seem uh, like too greedy to their fans, but they want to make some money too. And they know that those tickets could sell for $500 in the front row, but they don't want to seem greedy. So I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it was Britney Spears maybe that got into hot water um, a long time ago. It was some pop artist like that that purchased a bunch of the tickets and then was reselling them themselves to make money so that they didn't appear to be uh, profit making and greedy on the, on the front end. The music industry's kind of changed quite a bit with that. Um, with uh, you know how they sell music, with streaming and all of that stuff. Uh, but back in the day, that was kind of how you sold records and, and CDs and stuff, was having a big crowd, and people were willing to pay more, but they didn't want to appear greedy, so they would uh, do that. All right, okay. Well, I think we'll do an early break tonight. That was kind of the first part I wanted to uh, get through with. So that was chapter 12. So we skip 11, by the way. So in your book, 11 is skipped. So we're doing 12, 13, and 14 tonight. So let's go ahead and take a break. Um, let's just plan on, it's a little after 7.10. Let's just plan on 7.30 or uh, half past the hour, whatever your time zone you guys are in. And we'll see you back in oh, a little over 15 minutes. Um, yeah, we haven't decided all that. That'll be some of our discussions we'll have. It's just a year, though. It's just what? A year? Oh. Okay. Oh,
You know, I came in here earlier today to test the Zoom, and it seemed like the air conditioning was working. So I don't know. I was kind of like, oh, they must have fixed it, but I don't know if they. Is it on a schedule? I wonder if it is, because I swear it seemed nice and cool. Of course, it was a cool evening and stuff. That could have been part of it, too. Yeah, warm. It was cooler earlier today. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. Thank you. 
at all? Was it, was it pushing through the audio and the video? Not the audio. Not the audio. Yeah, that's what I thought. There, I think there's too much, too many things going on here. So I sent you guys the links. I'm going to play a couple of these. They're, they're mostly for fun, but a couple short videos. And you guys can watch them on your own device if you want while I'm uh, showing them here on the big screen in class.
can be purchased for five dollars. To fasten, insert the metal fitting into the buckle and tighten the buckle by pulling the loose end away from you. To release, purchase a release flap for seven dollars. Now I know what you're thinking. We've never paid for seat belts before. Once we've reached our cruising altitude, your flight attendant may or may not go down the aisle with snacks. If she chooses to, each passenger will be given a single peanut. <laughs> Laboratories are located at the front and the rear of the airport. Please take a moment to look at your safety pamphlet. The charge for looking at this pamphlet is $3. The charge for looking at this pamphlet and putting it back quickly is $4. Should there be a rapid change in cabin pressure, oxygen masks will automatically drop from the compartment above your seat. Free of charge. Place the mask over your nose and mouth. And to start the flow of oxygen, pay your flight attendant $75.63. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. As of now, you can As always, exact change is appreciated. Now I know that some of you are still concerned about getting there safely. Enjoy your flight. <laughs> Sometimes we feel that way. It might as well charge them looking at the window. That's certainly been the movement. Alright, here's one last video we'll do and then we'll get into some other stuff. In the previous program, we've assumed that every product or service has a price. All customers pay the same price. In this store, Everybody pays the same price for a particular thing like a mug. But in many markets, not everyone pays the same price for the same good or service. Some people pay more, others less. For instance, people on this aircraft are paying different prices even though they're on the same journey. This is my first experience of flying with the EasyJet. I paid about £125 for the return of the flight. But there were people on this flight who paid substantially more, and others who paid substantially less. So on just one flight, there's a whole range of different prices. Companies all over the world are looking for ways to maximize profits. One of the ways that some of them do this is through the process of price discrimination. This pig farm in Texas is owned by a Japanese meat company. They sell the same pork in the US and in Japan. But in Japan, the prices they charge are much higher. This holiday company sells the same holiday to different customers at different prices. Rail companies in Europe charge different prices to commuters and students for the same journey. Firms commonly charge different prices for the same product to different customers. This is true hotels, it's true on airlines, it's true on the railways. People who are traveling are not all paying the same price for the journey. The principle of charging different prices for the same product we call price discrimination. This program examines the practice of price discrimination, explores the circumstances in which companies are able to do it asks whether this practice is beneficial for the company and for the consumer.
next thing. So now, we're going to go to the board. All right, so we've got three keys to be a successful price discriminator. So three keys for successful uh, price discrimination. Number one, we need consumers with differing demands or differing elasticities. So we need consumers with differing Elasticities. If all the consumers are very similar to each other, it's not going to work, right? So the whole point we talked about the rich versus the poor, high income, low income, is one way to do it, and then there could be some other ways. So, but the main point is we have to have differing elasticity so that we can charge higher prices to those with more inelastic demand and lower prices to those with more elastic demand. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is you have to be able to separate your consumers. So ability to separate consumers. And I always like to add in legally. So we might have laws about doing it according to skin color, race, uh, religion, all uh, right, so following the law, you have to be able to separate consumers legally um, into their groups. So earlier you guys mentioned, um, was it you stormy with the student ID? Or who did student ID, or is that somebody online? Somebody did student ID. So our, how do we sell, tell students from non-students, you have the student ID, we feel pretty confident that uh, either it wouldn't be too worthwhile for somebody to falsify that, um, or uh, it's fairly hard to uh, replicate. So we might be able to do this. Why is that important? Well, otherwise we just have, what if we just did it verbally? What would be the problem of having a student discount without checking student IDs? Everybody would be lying. Yeah, oh, I get the student discount, I'm a student. I'm a student of the world. I'm a lifelong learner, right? So. I'm a student, so uh, yeah. I know that uh, with, uh, like Apple Music, they do the student. Um, Apple Music? Yeah. Yeah, and some of those, they, they do take the risk of allowing people to self-select, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that, too. If, it, you know, if, if the stakes are low enough, then maybe it's not a big deal, but otherwise you'll get people um, uh, pretending to be somebody that they're not. Okay, um, and then the last condition is that resale has to be, resale is difficult or cost prohibitive. So resale of the product is difficult or cost prohibitive. Why would we have that condition in place? Why would it start to, your price discrimination concept start to fall apart if resale is easy? Okay, yeah, the, the, the one with the cheaper prices, they can just buy it and resell it, and now they're running a little side business, right? And so by doing that, then you're not capturing the high value customers like you were before because the low value customers can resell to the high value customers. Um, so what do we see a lot of uh, price discrimination in? You mentioned the movie theater, right? Can you resell your move going to the theater experience? No, it's a service, right? So uh, haircuts and uh, other things where there's senior discounts or student discounts, um, if you got something that's resellable, then you better be careful because uh, people will probably start to do a little bit different business. All right, so different consumers, gotta be able to separate them. 
and resale is difficult. So these are the three conditions for direct price discrimination, what we call direct price discrimination. You guys mentioned like coupons and stuff before where we're gonna have people try to figure out creative ways to have people select into their categories without having to separate them. So this is, if you wanted to put a little extra note, this is direct price discrimination. So this is chapter um, 13 is direct price discrimination and the chapter uh, the next chapter is indirect price discrimination. For us, yeah. Would uh, Netflix be doing price discrimination? Like they're losing subscriptions for people possibly sharing and now they're gonna charge you if you share your password. Um I don't think that would fall under price discrimination. Um so with the password sharing, that's just people not following the rules, right? But Netflix always kind of turned the other cheek. Uh, they might have been in the fine print, but they never uh, enforced it. And so now they're going to try being petty. And I think people are going to turn. I think Netflix is right on the brink of becoming Blockbuster. I, I think Netflix might just disappear on us if, they're, if they don't manage their way out of this uh, carefully. But we'll, we'll find out. So in one form of price to discrimination be like if you have an Audible account and you go to cancel it and then they'll come at you and say, actually, they'll give you the same thing for $10 if you stay with us. Yes, that would be price discrimination, yeah, because you're having to go through that extra little hurdle and you're paying a different price than somebody else getting the exact same service. So you're revealing yourself as a lower value customer, right? You're like, you're charging me too much. I'm, I'm not one of these people over here. I'm this person. And so by threatening to leave, you've You've revealed yourself as a low value customer and so now we'll give you the deal and so a lot of places won't proactively go out and try to do that for customer service right they they've learned over the years that the most profitable thing to do is just to sit back and then they tell their customer service representatives if somebody calls in we're just we'll give it to them right just you know it's easy uh, what's the marginal cost of keeping them next to nothing right they have an account all the setup fees everything's been done the marginal cost of providing the service is zero, right? So now all of a sudden you're in a different bargaining position than you were before when you were getting a brand new service. And so that's why they have some flexibility. Um, I threatened to, I went and got the T-Mobile uh, deal uh, for internet and I called up Vive. We were being up to 80 bucks a month, I think, um, 79 or maybe it was gonna bump up to 89. And then T-Mobile came out with that $55 deal or whatever, which we set it up, we bought it, called to cancel Vive, and they're like, we can do it for 50. Just like that. And all they had to do was threaten and like, would you stay if it was 50? And I'm like, all right. And I honestly was going to switch. Uh, I, I, and she said, then she said, in fact, um, next year when it comes up for renewal, you just call and say for customer service that you want to keep the rate you had before and we're going to automatically give it to you. She just told me that straight up. So she said, your rate is going to be ramped up, but just you have to call customer service, uh, but you'll go straight to our department to keep you and we'll keep you at the low rate. So that's what she told me this. So they've got it set up long-term. They still have a process, right? So if I get sloppy and I don't ask for the break when I get the notice that my rate's going up or whatever, and I'm just willing to pay the new rate of 65 and life is busy and I don't care, then I continue to pay a higher rate. But all I have to do is make one phone call and she said, we'll keep you at that same rate. So yeah, those are all price discrimination schemes. Okay, so let's look at it quickly. I, won't, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but let's draw three demand curves. And here we'll have uh, students, and non-students, and then we've got the market. I like to do this so that you guys kind of have a refresher on what the, the market demand looks like and where it comes from. So the students, again, low income, maybe uh, they're at, uh, there's a few students who pay $10, but their demand curve is fairly flat and elastic. And then you've got the non-students who are willing to pay uh, up to 15, and then something lower. I should have drawn this more to scale. Actually, let me try to do that a little more to scale. Uh, and it looks like that's a 20 up there. Okay, so a little bit more to scale. 
So what does the market demand curve look like? Well, at a price of $10, we're only selling tickets to non-students. So we've got 100 out here at a price of 10. And so that's kind of our starting place. And then we start thinking, oh, well, what if I drop my price to $8? All of a sudden, a lot of students jump into the market, right? So we pick up 70 students, and of course we get a few more non-students, but they were willing to pay anyway, so it's 110. And so 70 plus 110 is 180 in the market. And then let's do one more here. So we drop down to six, linear demand curve. I went up by 70, so now this is 140. And this is 120. Um, yeah, down to, yeah, okay. So 140 plus 120 is 260 out here. Okay, so the point is, is that if I don't do price discrimination, this is what I'm looking at, right? This is the market demand curve, which is a mix of students and non-students. And then being a good price discriminator, uh, or not price discriminator, being a good monopolist or whatever, a downward sloping demand curve, I do the marginal revenue curve, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and I price my product accordingly um, to maximize profits. And so what that'll mean is that if I do have uh, 180 uh, students out there, or uh, at a price of eight, if that ends up being my one price, this is my mix of students and non-students. But now if I can separate out the students and I can charge a higher price to these guys, so there's the marginal revenue for the non-students, here's the marginal revenue for the students. My marginal cost, uh, let's just say is, I guess, uh, $6 get a different color going. You guys don't have, this, this is a little sloppy, I'm, so you don't have to perfectly have this down. But I'm just gonna do a constant marginal cost like we've seen in some of our homework problems. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue here. We charge the students $8. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue here. We charge the non-students $12. And so by doing that, <clears throat> notice what I did is I picked up more students, right? So I'm serving the poor. By being able to do that, I'm able to charge higher prices to non-students and lower prices to the students. And all at the same time, I'm making more money. So if I was a little more careful with all these numbers, we could kind of show the, uh, the profits being made with each situation, and this would be a profitable thing to do because we're capturing more money from the non-students. All right, so I just wanted to kind of bring that in for a couple reasons. One, don't forget, this is what the market demand curve is back from week two or whenever we started that, right? This is what we were dealing with. Now all we're doing is we're separating out the markets and then just pricing accordingly. We just price each person accordingly because I'm able to separate them legally and resale is difficult. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, um, let's see. So, yeah, let's go back to the, I was trying to think I was gonna maybe add one more thing is on my feet to be successful. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, there's a, the three things that we just went through. So arbitrage is the, the word that we use for buying in one market and selling in another. So buying in one place where you know there's places that you can sell in other places. So with uh, the example I like to do is um, the uh, liquor store. So suppose that uh, Blue Sky here <clears throat> has a student discount of 20%. 20% uh, discount for students. And uh, Leland over here is smiling because he knows what he would do if there was that sort of thing. So Leland's parking his car <laughs> outside the liquor store and he sees me coming up and I'm just going in to, to, to the liquor store to buy what, uh, my case of beer that I was looking for. And, and so I go up and all of a sudden Leland's like, psst, psst. hey, can I, uh, yeah, what can, what can I help you with? Um, would you like to get a discount in there uh, when you go to buy yourself? What are you buying? I'm like, I'm just buying a case of beer. And he's like, how about a 10% discount? And I'm like, I'm always up for a deal. I teach economics actually at Ottawa. That'd be great. And so I give Leland the money. Leland goes in, buys what I wanted, comes back out. He makes 10%. I get a 10% cut. Who loses? The business, right? And so that's why you got to be able to do these things, and otherwise, if you can defeat the price discrimination scheme, you're just going to be selling beer at a lower price, right? Everything's going to be sold at 20% discount, and it's not going to be a profitable thing to do. <laughs> All right, so the indirect part that we'll really get into more in the chapter 14 is when you can't separate out the groups or there might be resale. So how is a coupon different? What does a coupon, why is it different than what we've got going on here with direct? Who mentioned, was that you, Andres, that did the coupon, or who was that? That was you, John? Everyone. Yeah. And what's, because why? Everyone. Oh, I was asking Jonathan, but okay. So everyone can do the coupon, right? So then how can you be sure that your, your deal's gonna work? Why do coupons work? Look, because the only people who really need it are gonna put the time in to do this. Okay, so there's a little bit of a cost, right? So we got a, a dollar off a can of Campbell's soup. Big deal, right? So the Campbell's soup is $3 and now you're gonna pay $2. If you're a high income individual, are you going to be looking for those coupons? Are you gonna spend the time clipping the coupons? That was the old days. Now, what have we found as we moved into the internet age though, when coupons were there, were high income people grabbing onto the electronic coupons? Yeah, right? So at the margin, it started to not work as much because the cost was lowered the search cost was lower to finding the coupon. And so then they had to kind of change things up <clears throat> with uh, coupons and, pro and promo codes uh, to make that work. All right, can anybody think of other uh, things like a coupon where you can't tell the consumer? We've actually already talked about one. Go ahead, uh, Brianna. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I know someone mentioned earlier the early bird special and Yes. So I wonder if that works based on that because it's still somewhat indirect. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, and I did, um, I thought it was a, a little bit different, you know, dining at one, but it does bring in, if, if money's important to you and you don't mind eating, and of course this kind of falls in with uh, old people like to eat early, right? And I don't know if you guys have heard this from your grandpas and grandmas and, and other people like, oh, I can't be eating like you at nine o'clock at night. I'm gonna be restless, and I, so they, they need to eat earlier anyway in some cases. So that might go hand in hand with that. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we have people self-selecting. Most people aren't gonna wanna do it, but the lower value customers might come in at that time. Okay, any other examples? How about the airlines? Since we've talked about airlines a little bit. 
Who do we got for travelers? Army. What, Jason? Veterans and Army. Uh, no, that's not what I was thinking about. I mean, we do, but uh, not on the military discount type of thing. Because I want to be able to not identify. So I'm trying to do an indirect price discrimination. Who are Who's on that airplane with you guys when you're traveling? A mix of what kind of people? Business and pleasure, right? So rec you know, people who are visiting family or going on vacation, but then you also have the business traveler. How do the airlines figure out ways to charge business people more? When do airline prices get expensive? Jonathan? Closer to the departure date. So why would that possibly lead to business people getting it instead of pleasure people? Yeah, I go back to all that. Okay. Yeah. So all of a sudden, um, you have a new deal, possible business deal that's a that's a three million dollar deal, but you need to be in New York tomorrow. Is a $900 airline ticket that big of a deal for you? No, right? So the business aspect of it leads to possibly short-term travel. Now let's flip things and think about the airline. We were talking about capacity before, right? There's 200 seats on the airplane. And if there's uh, 20 seats open, would it be profitable for the airline to sell it to a, a family member who maybe there's a death in the family? And they have to pay the 900 too. Would it be prof profitable for them to do kind of a quick sale before the flight goes, let's fill this plane up? What's the marginal cost of adding another person to the plane once we've got 90% of it full and there's 20 empty seats of a 200 seat airplane? What's the marginal cost of adding another, another traveler for the airline? Very low, right? Think about it, what, what else are they added? They're already gonna serve the other 90% of the people. So from the airline's perspective, the marginal cost is darn close to zero. What are they gonna lose? Their bag of peanuts and a Coca-Cola. So what are we up to? Five bucks, let's just, let's just pretend to pick a number out of the air. It's five bucks of variable cost to put them on. Would it be profitable for the airline to sell that extra seat for 50 bucks? Yeah, it would be if they wouldn't find themselves in a mess later. Because what would consumer travelers, what would residential travelers, people who are traveling for vacation, what would they start to do if they knew the airline was going to have cheap prices closer to the end, like the day before the flight? They wait, right? And so that screws up their whole price discrimination scheme. So even though it would be profitable in the short run, if you will, right, in the very near term, uh, to sell a seat for 50 bucks when my marginal cost is five, they don't do it because they're in it for the long haul and they figured out that I wanna be able to capture the business travelers who are more than willing to pay $900 for the flight and get the recreational travelers to pay the 350. And so one of the ways they do that is through the timing. How many weeks do you have to be out to get kind of the lower prices? Some of you guys have traveled more than others maybe. You guys know how many weeks you have to be out? Three to four is usually the recommended to get the cheaper prices, but like on Southwest, it's two weeks. If you're, if you're within two weeks of the flight, then their prices are, are a lot higher. Um, so for Southwest Airlines, they've kind of chosen the two week and everybody kind of knows it's two week. But yeah, three weeks is kind of usually the recommended uh, amount of time. Uh, for some of the better pricing for airlines. Historically, I don't know if that's still true. That was an old study from probably 10, 15 years ago that that was optimal uh, timing for getting the lower price seats. Okay, so lots of different things to be thinking about, um, and that's kind of the issues with indirect versus direct. So, little quiz time. Tickets to a movie theater, senior, citizen, student discount, direct or indirect? Direct or indirect? Direct. Grocery store, discount coupons, in-store weekly newspaper inserts. Indirect. Indirect. 
Airlines, business versus economy. Indirect. All right, so how about our company, which for a lot of you is OU, but not everybody here. Price discrimination at your company. I might be interested in some of uh, maybe Kim or uh, Caleb. I can't remember where you guys work or other people that are non-OU. Maybe you guys have side jobs for that matter too. Jonathan? Oh, mine would be a similar case, but I'm at a Christian school, and so sometimes if a parent... What can, level of school, Christian um, school? K-12. Okay, K-12. So if a parent can't afford it, we might be able to work with something else. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, so if they come to you and say, oh, we'd really like to come to your school, but here's our income situation, and you guys have a process of having some scholarships, right, or something, whatever you label it, or yeah. di differential pricing. And do the uh, other families know that you do that for uh, lower income people, or do you, does it just kind of stay hush hush? I don't think. I think it's more hush hush. Okay. I don't think it's a big it. secret, but I don't think it's published either. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes the price discrimination could be a little more open. Like people might understand. Like, oh, I understand. We want to help lower income families, so. I don't care that I'm paying 20000 a year for my kid and they're only paying ten or something, right? Uh, the school has a policy and whatever, maybe an X amount of scholarships go out to lower income people, right? So it's possible that the price discrimination could be open, but typically it's more se secret or we just don't tell people about it, right? Um, do we tell our student athletes that everybody should publicize what their scholarship level is? No. Right, so we're, we try to say, oh, don't tell people uh, what you're at, it's not important, everybody's unique, blah, blah, blah. So uh, do sometimes lesser skilled people get bigger scholarships than higher skilled people? Yep, right? Because guess what? It's not all about the athletics, is it? It's about getting somebody to come to Ottawa University, to get a school, to be a butt in a seat, and start paying tuition. So don't be too hurt if you're like, I'm better than that person and they're getting a 60% scholarship and I'm only getting a 50. You know, it's not fair, it's not fair. Well, there's there's more things going on. So there's more things going on. All right, Caleb, what do you got? Caleb? I'm sorry? Did you, oh, it looked like your hand was up. Did you have an example? I was my eye. Oh, I think your, your digital hand was up. That's why I thought you were, you were trying to jump in. Um, or Kim, anybody else with other companies outside information? Um, I don't know if it would be, I've worked with the same company for 25 years. I don't really know the billing side of things, but I know there are different prices for patients that are self Okay. I don't, I don't know if that would fall into it at all. Yeah, um, so one thing that that could bring up that would be a little different than price discrimination, although it could possibly be, is if there's a cost savings for the company, right? So if you're using a some sort of self-pay system where there's a cost savings of people going paperless, for instance, right? So the company says, Gosh, if you go paperless, we'll, we'll give you $5 off your, your deal uh, because you're save, they're saving that in postage. That's, that's not price discrimination, right? So because of the cost savings, it could be, we could layer it in there somehow, but for the most part, if it's a cost savings thing, it wouldn't fall into the, the same category as price discrimination. Okay, uh, Jeremiah, what did you have? Uh, I was just trying to determine whether or not it was because when Calmar sells to Amazon, there, there's an economy of scale happening. So they sell at a bigger discount uh, to Amazon compared to when they sell to uh, auto and truck stock. Uh, but it, it, I mean, if you're looking at the average vehicle selling it, same vehicle sold to, uh, one to one. Amazon they sell to, those vehicles on Amazon? To Amazon? Oh yeah. The big, the big shipping trucks? That uh, they make? The or what terminal are you tractors. 
suckers. So yeah. Like distribution. They right? sell those to Amazon? Oh, Amazon just You can go on Amazon and buy one of those suckers? No, no, no. Amazon, like, at the distribution centers, yeah. bought and uses them. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So we'll get into that. That is that is a form of price discrimination that's more in the indirect thing. But yeah. it, we'll get into pricing with volume discounts and stuff yeah. like that. So that could be part of it. Now I understand where you're going. Yeah, sorry. No, you can't buy one of <laughs> I was thinking you can go on Amazon and get one of these. So for those of you who don't know, here in Ottawa, Kansas, we have these goofy looking trucks that were specifically designed to haul containers around. Uh, so all these mass shipping, uh, where cargo ships come in and then they take the uh, container and then they put it on a semi or whatever. Well, they've designed these specialized vehicles that move containers around. And so there, it's it's a global company that operates out of here, out of Ottawa, Kansas. Of course, they have other locations as well, uh, but that's kind of a neat neat place here. And they're they've been the good sponsor of OU over over time as well. So. Okay. So give this a read. Okay, so you guys got the, the gist of what's going on here. So $120 was kind of the worldwide single price, but we got this new market, lower income country. Um, maybe they could really get a foothold there with a 10% penetration and it could be profitable in the long run. So what's the fear here if they start charging a lower price? What would be the concern? Let's get somebody who hasn't talked yet. between 7 and 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Sorry, we heard from you. Yeah, you participated in here. You were here from you. Samir, you got a little quiet. I think you did too much. I'm not going to take you out because we've got this on. So, what do you think there? So, they charge a lower price. What? What concern might they have with a price discrimination where they start selling lower priced phones in the Philippines? What would be a concern about doing a price discrimination scheme like that? Arbitrage. Arbitrage, right. So what's arbitrage? Okay, so if we, if the Filipinos start buying them cheap and selling them worldwide, then that would defeat the purpose, right? So it falls under our our number three category, that resale is going to be possible. And so that's something that they would need to be concerned about. So they were worried about that. And so they made some adjustments. Here's where they were over time, trying to penetrate the market. And they went with it to $90. And we had some arbitrage. Then they went with SIM locks. So they went, they tried to lock down the phone so that it would only work in the Philippines in the local markets. And then the Turkish hackers came. And they broke the SIM lock. And 15,000 phones were sold to Europe. And then they found out a way to, to break that. So they kind of had to go through this tug and pull of figuring out how they were going to do it. Ultimately, it was a success. But it wasn't without a few battles on figuring out a way to do price discrimination. So their market share grew to 25%. And then they ultimately went back to global pricing. Once they were in there and they ended up having a good market share. 
All right, so we have some laws. Why don't you guys go ahead and give this a read? So where have we had, what does this resonate with you? Like, what company comes to mind where we got maybe some supplier discounts going on? Walmart. Walmart, yeah, right? So mom and pop stores, uh, Main Street's going out of business. So this kind of happened, the Robinson Patent Act, I can't remember exactly what year, but I'm 1942 comes to mind or something. So it, it was a while back, but they saw kind of the growth of that and pushing small businesses out, so they try to pass a law. And I don't think this one gets enacted as much uh, because when there are lawsuits, uh, you know, like you were saying with Amazon or big sellers that they could buy those trucks, we're gonna contract with multiple. And so uh, the price discount would be uh, justified. So. That's something that kind of usually takes a lawsuit, but there have been attempts over time to change the laws on how these companies interact with each other. So would it, would it run afoul of that law if you said, well, this, this volume discount is available to anybody who purchases at this volume? That, and that's right, that, that, that would be the carve out for it, okay. yes, is that it's not special pricing. You can get it too, but you gotta buy 100 of these or whatever. Well, I only want two. Um, and so you're right, if you're equal treatment for everybody, then that so would get around that. It's indirect discrimination because it really only benefits the large Right, players. it'll still benefit the big ones, but it's open to everybody, yeah. All right, give this a read. So there's been a lot of learning that's gone on since the World Wide Web evolved, but this was one price discrimination. You know, it's just that drop down, right? Are you a business or are you a consumer? And then all of a sudden you get different pricing for the exact same computer. So what have companies done when they found out, oh, well businesses, people started learning and the boss just says, oh, well just click, click small, medium, don't click large, even though we're a large business. Right, again, and once that learning comes out, and, uh, then everybody's buying them at 11.97 and it doesn't work anymore. So what do computer companies do now to kind of separate out business and consumers? Yeah. Discount for volume. Volume. What's that? Discount for volume. Okay, volume discounts, which would kind of bring us back to the other discussion, so that's possible. But how about on individual purchases? But that is, that is one way. What have you noticed with a business grade machine versus the consumer grade machine? What are some things that the company might do? Jonathan? The processing power, right. So we might just change a few tweaks. This is model 646X, this is, which is the business grade machine. And this is model 646C, the consumer grade machine, right? And so if you look at them side by side, they look identical, but one has a little bit slightly faster processor, one has a little bit more memory or something, right? They do some little tweaks. So what they do now is for the business grade machine, they'll add $20 worth of up to it, right? A little higher processor or whatever. So at the cost at the margin is only 20 bucks, but they get to charge $13.39, right? So the business machine is indeed a little nicer, but not that much nicer. But that was enough to get a differentiation so that they can um, get customers uh, paying the, for the higher valued machine. I kind of just did this for the Gorky Institute. I just bought my first MacBook Pro Air M2 chip so that Luke 
can uh, process videos for the Gordon Institute a little bit faster. And so they had uh, the M1 chip versus the M2 chip. I'm not a Mac guy, so this is I was learning all of this, but you know, it was uh, $200 more to get the M2 chip. How much do you think the incremental cost for Apple was of that M2 chip versus the M1 chip? Probably back to my $20, right? But I want the best machine for my uh, graduate assistants to be processing these videos. And so, or if you're a business, you want the best processor and it might really pay for it, right? It's like 200 bucks, that's nothing. If my employee is gonna be able to be more productive with the faster processor, it's kind of a no brainer. But again, you get, you're able to sort the high value customers into the low value customers by the way you present or package your product. Okay, so that's kind of a update on how that one works. So your textbook talks about schmucks. I don't know if that was just his definition or, or how that worked, but nobody wants to be a schmuck. <clears throat> So how do you feel when you learn later after you've purchased something that you could have got it cheaper if you would have done this or that, right? That's the idea. Maybe you would have searched around and you kick yourself because you didn't look hard enough or you didn't know. What's that? Makes you buy it twice. Makes you buy it twice. Yeah, you can refund it maybe, return it, and, and get it back. So yeah, I just hate that. And so then uh, for me, it, it makes me do irrational things. Like I will just spend hours and hours combing through every corner of the internet to make sure I'm getting the cheapest price possible. Actually, I did this with this MacBook Pro. Um, I went to the Apple site and kind of built the computer. And then, uh, actually the main thing that drove this was that it wasn't gonna be available till August 15th by the time we got it. So then I went to Micro Center in Overland Park and they had one in stock. And so then I just reserved it and they had a, a little bit better price even, so I felt pretty good about that so um, so that is the thing that companies have to be uh, careful of so when you see a promotional code box what do you guys do Google, Google the promo code right and uh, apparently companies have found pretty good ways to defeat that most of the time have you found that you hit dead ends usually when you hit when you search for promo code it's like they're out there and then somebody else has a pay window like, oh, if you join our club, then we'll give you the promo codes and that probably doesn't work out or the promo code's expired or whatever. Uh, but that's what we do. So when the cost was low to search, then we'll, we want to make sure we aren't leaving any money on the table and see if we get it. So it was even worse though, what they found was that if they lost the customer, because they're searching for a promo code, they never came back. So that was even a worst case scenario. It's not like they're not getting the discount, but if they have the promo code box and they lost them, they, lost, they found that they would go buy it somewhere else um, because uh, they wanted to get the promo code. So it could even have worse impact than that. <clears throat> All right, so that's where we get into the secrecy thing like we were talking about with the uh, maybe the tuition or other things. All right, um, so we'll go through this example here. So we had uh, people going to a conference and they had people that would usually attend that were close, but then they wanted to attract more foreigners. Of course, foreigners have better travel costs, travel times, blah, 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 all of that stuff. So they thought, let's reduce our fee for the foreigners. But how would they get, how would they be able to enforce that, that people would say they're from someplace else? What could they do? Any ideas? Show passport, okay, so yeah, maybe you can prove that you're from another country. In this particular case, they mailed out the offer directly to the foreign uh, participants of the conference, people who were members of the association or whatever, they gave them a direct mail so that the other people didn't see that they were getting a reduced rate. Um, that's how they ended up tackling that one. Okay, so that I think ends chapter 13. Uh, let's see. Oh, I don't have the 
Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, so now indirect pricing. Oops, wait, I didn't screen share. Sorry, Zoomers. to the to the zoomers here so all right how many people are iphone iphone users owners gosh most of you how many people are android what come on are you just not willing to admit it seriously all right i was gonna say i am yeah i'm raising my hand what about you guys only one person if only one person seriously what's this got an iphone huh that's not, this is not yeah, yeah, no, well, that one's my Institute one, yeah. The, I have, the Institute is Apple, but yeah, personally... Yeah, the Institute's Apple because Apple is superior with the video and the processing and all of that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, that's the first iPhone I've ever purchased. Um, so, Caleb, Brianna, why don't you guys go to the chat box? Are you Apple or Android? i, I got to see if we've got... If I have any other company. Android, okay, Caleb's Android. Brianna's Android, good, okay. And, and you're Andrew. Okay, so we got we got some company now. So I don't know what that says. So business people are uh, online as as Android. Okay. So Apple got themselves into some hot water back a while back. So it seemed like a good idea to get the old ones gone, but they ended up having to unravel the whole thing. So price discrimination goes on in this way too, if we think about clothing. If you're a high value, high fashion person, when do you buy the latest thing that came off the runway? When it first comes out or six months later when it's on the outlet mall when it first comes out right so same thing here the high value Apple customers are the first ones in line standing in line to get the new product or whatever and so there's your high value customers and so they did the price discrimination by offering the discount but it was too close to them and the high value customers felt like they got gypped and so they ended up cutting the price for everybody so that was a pretty expensive mistake for Apple um, with, uh, uh, with the pricing that they did and the negative publicity that they got. I don't know why this thing's staying up here. Let's see if it's because this is not. So I'm trying to figure out put this. Apple Android. Oh, Noah's Apple. Oh, Noah's the other one. <laughs> so we still got that pattern. Okay, there we go. All right, so how many of you have owned an inkjet printer? Okay, what did you find out after you ran out of your first one that came with the machine? It's expensive. It's expensive. So that stinks, doesn't it? You're like, oh, well this is pretty reasonable, and honey, it's only $60, let's, let's get the color printer. And then, of course, the green is the first one to run out but then you go there for one green cartridge and they have the multi-pack of every color that's a little bit cheaper on average if you, if you buy that. So ink cartridges are kind of a pain in the butt. Well, that was very intentional on Hewlett Packard's uh, uh, business model, right? So they thought, let's give the machine out cheap and get the people on the ink cartridges. So that was a form of price discrimination with complimentary uh, products that was indirect. 
And why is this not advancing? There we go. So we talked about the Kansas City Royals tickets, movie theaters, and popcorn. Right, get get people in with cheap prices for the entry fee to the movie, and then ten dollars for popcorn and a soda. But look at that! Look at those numbers: ten billion dollars worth of printers and twelve billion of ink cartridge sales. So they had that in mind all along. Now, what made that work for the printer? Why were they able to pull that off? What's unique about that compared to maybe some other things like? I don't know, even movie theater, popcorn, and uh, uh, going to the theater. You What's don't that? have a choice, you have to buy the ink versus you don't have to buy the popcorn? Yeah, yeah, the choice part, right? So in order to get the printer to work, you need to have the ink. But you can go to the theater without buying the popcorn. So um, companies have to play that a little bit differently depending on what it is. So. With HP, you have to have that. It was a special cartridge with a patent or whatever, and so pretty hard to duplicate, and so they were able to do that. Um, uh, John Deere does this a little bit with uh, uh, implements and other things that you put on your tractor. So the tractor is one price, but then you have the extras that you put on the tractor or parts are fairly marked up uh, marked up high for replacement parts. Is that like razor blades? Or like razor blades? So yeah, razor, yeah, the razor blades, yeah. So if, if you uh, have bought, now there's another part with razor blades and razors um, that they caught uh, a little bit of grief on for men and women. Do you guys hear about this one? So first of all, let's cover the razor blades and razors. Is that um, you buy the razor, comes with blade, and then you go to buy replacement blades and they're, you know, $20 for five of them. Or something like this is crazy. Um, so, does they, I saw a few heads shaking. What was the thing with men and women? The men were charged less than the women for razors. Yes. So they were. So if they had a, uh, you know, the feminine shaving your legs, whatever type razor that was, you know, designed for women, made for women, blah blah blah. Uh, but that one was being sold at a lot uh, higher price than what the men's razors were, and so somehow they. I, I remember hearing this on the news or something that was brought up that um, they were upset with the razor company. So yes, they, even the razor company was, was doing a little um, discrimination, you know, could a, uh, can a wo woman buy a, ma a male, you know, quote unquote male razor? Of course, right? Yeah, so there's, that's all the same, but targeting it and packaging it and whatever, uh, they had higher margins on the, uh, the female packaged razors. All right, so let's see this in action here. So um, here's the two strategies for the print, uh, for the printer. Strategy number one: fifty dollar printer, fifty dollar cartridge. And then you've got your low value customers. So these are our people who are only going to buy one cartridge, or we're not using the printer very much. Um, and then we've got the high value customers. Maybe this is businesses or other people that are using it more. They have a $200 value on the printer itself. So there's kind of the printer value, and this is the cartridge use, right? So it kind of got different parts that are moving here. So if we go with the first strategy, then we make $100 off the low value people. They buy one printer and one cartridge uh, together. And with the high value people, we get the two cartridges and they pay the $100 or the $50 printer with two cartridges, so we make $250. Or we basically give the printer away for free and make our money on the cartridges. These guys buy one cartridge, these guys buy two, the company makes $300. Right? So we're able to capture some of that consumer surplus that we were that I started off with tonight on how can we get the higher value people paying more. Sometimes we can get creative with the way the product is and maximize uh, profits that way. So this is called a metering scheme, uh, where you're metering the number of uh, 
uses people are doing, and you're able to make money off, off the volume of uh, extras that they're buying. Okay, questions or comments there? competitors coming in uh, with the refillable ink cartridges. Do you guys remember those at all for the HP? Like you could buy your own ink and you had like a, a, a syringe or something that you'd refill the refillable ink cartridge. And so possibly people get innovative on coming up with solutions when a company has this as their pricing scheme. And think about how detrimental that could be for HP. They gave away the printer and if they can't capture the ink sales, they're screwed, right? If they gave away the printer at basically at cost, anticipating that they were gonna be able to have the ink sales, but all of a sudden a new innovation, a new competitor popped out of nowhere, um, uh, maybe there was a law change or something, uh, then that, that would really um, ruin their whole uh, scheme very fast. Okay, so tying, uh, for me, rings a bell for real estate. So a tying arrangement would be something like, uh, you're trying to sell your house and I'm your real estate. So we got taught this in, re in real estate school here when you're getting your license. Um, if, you, if, if you use me to sell your house, I'll discount my commission on your next house. So the sale of this house was tied, the commission rate was tied to you doing two transactions with me. So that's a tying arrangement, and that is against the law. So, but people have tried to do this for ages. So businesses like construction companies, um, you use our construction company and our agency and we'll reduce, the, we'll reduce the rate for you on the sale of the home. Something along those lines where you're tying two independent things together and forcing people into it can get you into uh, antitrust laws. So um, that was another thing to try to break up small mom and pop versus big businesses and other things uh, to keep competition alive was the intent. All right, questions or comments there? Any of that? So Minitab was this computing software, and the price discrimination scheme was slightly different. The student version, like we talked about with some other things, versus the full-featured model for businesses. And it was a pretty significant difference, right? So $50 versus $11.95. Do you guys know of some other software companies that have done a similar thing, where you've got the full-featured version versus the the not so hot version. Apple. Apple with what? Google phones and they made the SE phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, they have different versions that they do a little bit. Um, so that could be with the processing speed or it doesn't, it doesn't have all the functionality. Okay, that, that could be a possibility. Other software come to mind? Microsoft. Microsoft, like what? I think you're right. Like offering all the like Excel and PowerPoint for students cheaper. Okay, so the bundling of that package. Now, I and I think in some cases, um, it might not have all the features available with it, um, but I'm not positive totally with the, with the Microsoft thing. I'm thinking some of the editing software like Adobe, um, where you've got the one that can do 
all the stuff that architects needed to do, but then you've got the other version, and this is in their design software. I, I think they had stuff like that. So <clears throat> which one did they design first, the Cadillac or the Chevy? Yeah. The Cadillac. So think about this. When they did the designing of the software on what all it can do, they did the full featured version. So in order to sell it and price discriminate and hopefully make more money, they broke it, <laughs> right? They unplugged some of the features like, oh, okay, well, if we make it this good, this good, then we know that businesses won't wanna buy this version, but the lower value customers might, right? So they get creative on breaking it in a sense or making it not function as at the same level that they originally designed it for. Okay, so kind of an interesting way to, to do some price discrimination that way. So here's the numbers again. So with the software, we got the home users and the commercial users. We got the businesses. So with the full featured version, they're willing to pay 175. The disabled version 150, right? It's like, I'm not gonna use those features. Yeah, it'd be nice to know I could, but in reality, I don't value those extra features that much. But the business over here, the disabled version they value at 200, but we really need that additional functionality to do what we want to do and be productive at work. So their differential is higher with the full feature version. So then how can we do this? Well, sell only to commercial users at a single high price. In other words, just do the full featured version. And we make 500 bucks and forget about the low value users. Or we do this versioning and we price it at 175. I'm sorry, this wasn't the version. This was just to price it at 175. We're of course gonna sell it to the commercial user and we're gonna pick up the home user. So 175 plus 175 is 350 or the disabled version. So 150 at the disabled picks up the home user and then the full featured at 449 and they could have even went a little higher here, but that would be the, the price they could do incrementally to pick up the, uh, the business. And so that's how we can stage things to be profitable and why we see some of these things in the market. Okay, questions or comments there? Yeah, Jonathan? I think the textbooks give us the rationale for the 449 because it's to do with the consumer surplus. Yeah, it was the amount of consumer surplus above it. Yeah, I, I, I think so it's just $1 yes. under their uh, differential to pay. Okay, anything else there? Laser concept going on here with the laser printer. Businesses want the faster product and households don't need it that fast. So let's break the machine. In reality, it's the same shell, it's the same mechanics. They could make it do that, but let's slow it down intentionally. They actually had to spend money to slow it down. Right? But it, it's worth uh, spending a little bit so that we can do some price discrimination. Southwest Airlines entering the market, competition changing. Questions or comments on that one? <clears throat> All right, now we got our volume discounts. So again, this type of discrimination is open to anybody, but you have to buy that volume. So it's indirect in that respect. So we've got a willingness to pay of seven for the first unit, six for the second, five for the third. So this is just our downward sloping demand curve. Right? So if we, 
draw this one out. Let's get a little board work going. So one, two, three. Now, the difference here compared to what we were doing before is that this is you, all right? This is your individual demand curve. When I, when I put it on the board before, I, students and non-students and then the market demand curve, we all kind of face the same thing, right? We all, we might want one of them, maybe we'll have two, but I don't really need a second one. But if it was cheap enough, I might do it, right? So this is all you, your individual demand curves is what we're uh, focusing in on here. Okay, so to get two units, you'd have to have a price of six. And so now we've got our uh, consumer surplus going. And let's see if we can make some money. So with this problem, we're going to say four, five, and six. Four, three, and two. If my marginal cost is above 50, then could I get these sold? Right? That's what I'm trying to do. Um, but we got to find a way to do it at a lower price without lowering the prices of all the units. So this particular type of problem can get a little tricky. Um, if we're trying to keep people in one spot or the other, if we make it too cheap, then everybody buys the volume discount. And that might not be as profitable as having some people buy it at the higher price and other people at the lower price. So we need to kind of be thinking, how are people going to behave? Is their uh, elasticity of demand different enough? All right, so here's some options. Volume discount. Buy one, $7, the second at six, the third at five. So we just keep saying the extra unit falls right down the demand curve would be one way to do it. Uh, buy one for seven, but we'll wait, we'll give you a, a dollar discount if you buy a second one. And so is that worth it to you? Yeah, your, your benefit, marginal benefit, because the demand curve is marginal benefit curve, your marginal benefit is $6 and the cost is $6. So that's the volume discount thing, is just kind of trucking along the demand curve. Uh, but usually we wouldn't be able to do it perfectly like that because everybody's different, right? The different willingnesses to pay. And so what companies end up having to do is the buy one, get one free, or something like that is, is uh, this type of discount. <coughs> Another technique is the two-part pricing. So Costco charges a membership fee. Uh, the golf course charges a membership fee, maybe. And then you have to pay for every round. It's not free, maybe. Uh, some places will do it for free. You pay one membership fee and you can go as much as you want. Other places might have a fee per use. So by charging a membership fee, well, what are we trying to get at? Well, we want to get that consumer surplus as the upfront fee. <clears throat> so here with this particular problem, the consumer surplus was the difference between the $27, which was all of the units, all the way up, adding up the seven plus six plus four, five, four, three, two, and the cost of six units at a marginal cost of a buck fifty, a buck fifty times six is nine. So that would leave the consumer surplus area of the triangle that we've been talking about. And here we're just adding them up. So now we've got $18 of consumer surplus. What if I charged an $18 membership fee and then let you buy as much as you want at the at the cost. 
that might be a way to do it, right? If I can charge a big enough membership fee, grab onto your consumer surplus, or at least some of it, um, and then sell them at cost or do have a little bit of a, a variable cost price. So what other businesses do you guys come to mind that do this type of thing with the two-part pricing? I guess I mentioned a couple of them, but. Gyms. Gym, so gym membership, good. What else? Like Prime Video, like you wait, uh, you rent out the movie. Okay, sure, yeah, for Prime Video, yeah. So Amazon does the membership fee, and then you've got the products that you buy, and you get free shipping or whatever. Okay, any other ones come to mind? Costco. Costco, good. So Sam's Club and Costco kind of followed that model. I got originally sucked into Sam's Club because of car tires. They, they had the cheapest car tires, and I remember uh, buy, buying into the first Sam's Club membership that was in town because I wanted to get some car tires, and their tires were basically the membership fee plus the tires was cheaper than what I, where I was finding tires elsewhere, so I'm like, oh, okay, perfect, I'll do that, and then I've got a membership to Sam's. So, Luke, did you like car and washes? Costs. And the fuel costs, yeah. I was in like the car washes are starting to do that kind of. Oh yeah, the one in town, the car wash in town does a membership fee thing of, uh, so is that per wash you pay something too, or is it, un no, that one's unlimited washes if and you're they a. they have like a deal where if you have the subscription, subscription you come in on like a Tuesday or something. Oh, and okay. And you get like, a, like their top service for a discount. Okay. So if you have the subscription or something. Yeah, so the car wash in Ottawa here, kind of had a membership fee type of um, base. Okay, any other ones coming to mind? All right. All right, so this one's a true story. doesn't know me from anybody else, right? They don't know my willingness to pay of what I'm willing to pay for cable or internet or phone, right? I'm just a customer out there. So how can they extract the most money out of each individual customer knowing that everybody's a little bit different and has different preferences? Well, bundling is one answer to that. So any single product is 30, so you're thinking, oh, well, 30, oh, I could have cable, I could have internet, I could have phone. But wait, if you get all three bundled together, then the price is 55. So how does that work to being profitable? So here's an example for me, and this was true, by the way. Um, I didn't really want cable. Uh, when I was in Ames, we, we had cable for free, but with streaming was starting to come on more, and, and so we found ourselves not wanting cable. I really just wanted internet, and then basically had zero use for a local phone, but if it was five bucks, who knows, maybe, you know, maybe I, would, I would get the line. So, but you know, if somebody else moves to town, they could have different pricing structures. So grandma moves into Ottawa, and hers looks like $40 for a local phone. I gotta have my local phone, right? She doesn't even have a cell phone, so she needs a local phone, but she doesn't even know what the intranet was, the World Wide Web, so she's got a $5 price tag on internet and a $40 on local phone. AT&T doesn't know the difference between us, right? So how can I get Grandma and Russ to buy our services? Well, we can bundle them. That way we can capture Grandma and Russ potentially. So Russ's willingness to pay then for the bundle is I value cable at 15, 40 for the internet, and $5 for a local phone. Grand total value for Russ of $60. Am I gonna buy the bundle? Yes, and I did buy the bundle. I got a local phone and I didn't ever, I said, I don't even have a landline. I don't, I don't even, I never plugged it in, but I got local phone service because I bought the bundle. And is grandma going to buy the bundle? 
Yes, right? And so this is a way for companies to um, offer things uh, and, and, uh, to people where they don't know their preferences through bundling. Um, what, let's see, I wanted to say one more thing about this. It escaped me. Where else do you see some bundling? TV subscriptions. TV subscriptions. Okay, like what? Yeah, what's Hulu, Disney, and ESPN Plus. Okay, so buying them packaged together. Yeah. So do I want Disney because I have kids? Do I want ESPN because I'm a sports nut? Right. So now, how can I capture the family of five with three youngsters? and the single guy who wants ESPN that might watch something and maybe has a low value on the Disney, but a high value on the ESPN, right? So by bundling those together, we can get all of them. What's true about the marginal cost for AT&T? This is the question that was coming to mind that I, that I forgot to bring in. What's the marginal cost of adding an additional service with the bundle for Russ? Luke? Zero, right? I mean, what is it, a couple clicks? The wiring, it all comes across the phone line, right? Into your router and into your whatever, into your house. It doesn't matter if you have all three or just one, it is literally zero marginal cost for the company to do that. So that plays into this too, that they can do this bundling because it's, no cost. Once they've got you as a customer, it is zero cost for them to add on another service. So this is when bundling especially gets uh, easy to do. Okay, other bundling examples? Yeah, look. Progressive insurance. Okay, and how so? I know they have like those advertisements where like they bundle everything, boat, RV. Yeah, boat, RV, house. You're gonna get a discount if you get the bundle, right? So here's what the bundle looks like and then that might induce you to move your insurance over from some other place. Anders? Fast food. Fast food, oh yeah, that's a real good one, okay. So explain that as a bundle. Explain the bundling concept with fast food. I think you're, you're totally right. It's like you can get a burger for seven dollars or a burger for fries and a drink for nine bucks. Okay, so thinking about it now in this, through this lens, um, so we got the, the burger, fries, and drink. And so we've got the burger at $5 individually priced, the fries at $2, and the drink at $2. And so we've got a $9 price tag. So I run into this quite a bit when I go, because I usually just want the sandwich. I'll get a big sandwich and make it a double or whatever. How can they induce me into doing that when other people might be, you know, their value might be placed on the fries? So when we add up the total, it's $9, but if you buy them all together, it's only seven. So the $7 price tag, how can they extract another $2 out of Russ? Well, at the margin, what am I paying if I value the burger at five? What am I paying for the extra stuff? two bucks, right? Now other people might put less weight on the burger and more on the fries. So yes, the, the uh, supersizing and the, well, supersizing might not be the, the same, quite the same thing, but bundling the whole meal deal together gets some people at the margin to push them over uh, into buying it that they're, and they feel good about themselves because they see the $9 versus I'm saving money. Guess what? You're not saving money, you're spending money. You just spent two more dollars than you would have spent, right? So you're not saving when you're spending. That's always kind of a fun thing uh, to, to work through on, on spending. The, the business was successful at extracting more money uh, out of your pocket. Okay, other bundling examples, that was a good one. Caleb, is your digital hand up just by accident, or is it, you got a digital hand up, I see, it looks like. Or maybe you don't see, <laughs> judging by the expression on your face. No, okay. I, it 
didn't know it was up. I don't know. Okay. All right. So that is it. We're getting out early tonight. How about that? A special night indeed. We got class next Wednesday, right? We got class next Wednesday. What? Wednesday for class. Yes, I'm glad you remembered. Um, so I, I have a conference that I'm going to be at um, through Tuesday, so that's why I moved for uh, Wednesday. So next week is Wednesday uh, at our same bat time, same bat channel. But uh, Wednesday next week for class. Thanks for the reminder.